the unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. I vow to pay homage to all the Buddhas. I vow to praise the Tathagatas. I vow to make unlimited offerings. I vow to repent and reform all karmic hindrances. I vow to rejoice in others' merits and virtue. I vow to request that the Buddhas turn the Dharma wheel. I vow to request that the Buddhas continue living in the world. I vow to always follow the Buddha's teaching. I vow to comply always with the needs of all sentient beings. I vow to transfer all merit and virtue universally. So who is Samantabhadra Bodhisattva? His name means that which is universally worthy or universally good. He is said to have practiced the way of the Bodhisattva for immeasurable kalpas, seeking all wisdom and fulfilling his limitless vows in order to relieve the suffering of all sentient beings. In other words, he is one who has put the practice into action for immeasurable time. He is one who has made those vows and kept to them, trained his mind with them. Samantabhadra represents correct doctrine, but not in the sense of what you read about in the books, but correct doctrine in the sense of doing practice correctly. There is a great little line from a lecture that Ajahn Chah gave to a group somewhere, I don't know where. And he encourages people to ask the questions that should be asked. We need to take up practice and ask the questions that we need to ask about practice. When we don't understand something, we need to ask the questions. It seemed like a bit of a throwaway point, but it also seems very important. We need to engage in our practice. So Samantha Bhadra was one who studied the Dharma when there were things that he didn't understand. He asked the question. He represents correct practice and he emphasizes the samadhi. When I was reading a little bit about Samantabhadra, I kept running into fancy words that didn't make sense to me. <laughs> Sometimes Western scholars say he's the bodhisattva of praxis. Praxis, what does that word mean? Who knows? <coughs> <clears throat> Samadhi is another one of those complicated <coughs> words. The thing about the Dharma, however, is that sometimes we'll ask a question and the answer will be something that is incomprehensible to us. Not because the person answering the question doesn't understand the question, but because we're, we're not able to understand it yet.
one time in a meeting of the community here at Shasta when River Master G was live, there was some turbulence going on and we were just talking about the situation and something was said which I didn't understand and I asked Reverend Master Jiu if she could explain what she meant by something. And she gave me a look and said, do you understand how to handle the three pure precepts? And I said, I don't know. And she said, okay, when you understand how to handle the three pure precepts, come back and ask me that question again and then we'll talk about it. I'll come back to that story in a minute, but let me keep going here. So samadhi, samadhi has always been a word that I don't understand or doesn't make sense to me. As I was reflecting on it, in terms of Samantabhadra and practice, in terms of the theme of our retreat, activity in stillness, stillness in activity, I realized that part of what Samadhi means is the meditative mind that we can bring to our day-to-day -day activities in which we are not in conflict with those day-to-day -day activities in which we are not in conflict with our own mind and self. The mind that just gets on and does what needs to be done. We might recognize that we are in a kind of samadhi, we might not. Probably we won't. We'll just be going about our business, going about doing what needs to be done. Sometimes samadhi is described as one-pointedness of mind, but that doesn't really get at it. It points in the direction. It doesn't get at it because there is no one point. There is just getting on the life that is present. So Samantabhadra represents practice, correct practice, done in the mind of meditation, the mind of just letting go and getting on, doing what needs to be done. He represents activity and meditation together. Traditionally, uh, in a Soto Zen monastery, um, I'm told, the main altar will have a statue of the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, and on the left hand will be Manjushri Bodhisattva, and on the right hand, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. And Samantabhadra and Manjushri are said to be the chief assistants of Shakyamuni or Vairochana Buddha. Traditionally also, again, the right hand represents activity, that which is done to aid beings. So, Man so Samantabhadra is on the right hand of the Buddha. He's, if you'll forgive the phrase, the right hand man of Shakyamuni Buddha the one who goes out and helps beings in an active way. So Mantabhadra rides an elephant. In India at the time, an elephant would have represented a kind of working animal like a horse or a dog, an animal that was living the life of assisting human beings. He represents steadfast effort, 
and the ability to overcome all obstacles. The elephant is usually depicted as being white to symbolize his pure purity of intention and effort and has six tusks. Six tusks representing the six paramitas. The elephant is practicing. The <coughs> elephant is practice. One day my teacher told me a story about being with Reverend Master Jiu and going through her day-to-day -day activities. People would come and have their complaints or make their reports or do whatever. And he had the sense that Reverend Master Jiu was like Samantabhadra's elephant, just carefully going down the jungle path every now and then moving, carefully moving a log from the <coughs> way, clearing the path for others to follow. Steadily, steadily, we just practice one step at a time. Now, Samantabhadra is sometimes referred to as the bodhisattva of selfless love. And I suppose we need to talk about what that means. There is a Tibetan manifestation of Samantabhadra as a, one of the primord, primordial Buddhas, I guess. And uh, he's sitting in with well, anyway, that's not the Samantabhadra that we're talking about. This Bodhisattva is, again, the Bodhisattva of activity that benefits love, benefits beings. This is love. It is a love similar to a parental love like that thing when you are about to stick your hand in fire and your mother yells at you or maybe smacks you on, says, don't put your hand in fire. This is the love of our teachers when they say, yeah, you know, you need to keep the precepts. Or the love of our teachers when they say, so-and-so is not doing correct practice. This love is love that is giving teaching to help us to learn about our own suffering and to learn about the suffering of the world. Every Master Jiu says that a teacher who gives this kind of teaching will accept the consequences of their own actions, the logical consequences of their own actions. So if your teacher is criticizing someone who needs to be, whose actions need to be pointed out, then they will accept the consequences of that action of criticizing, which is contrary to the precepts. Sometimes it needs to be done. Sometimes our teacher will ask us to do a hard thing, to look at something difficult about ourself, and it will be hard for us to bear. There's a nice section again I referred to yesterday in Zen is Eternal Life about the mind of Samantabhadra. And I used to read that section and think, this isn't really about what I'm going to become. I'm reading it now to understand how to deal with Samantabhadra as it appears in my life. Samantabhadra is the one who carries the Kyosak. The Kyosak is the sword of Buddha's wisdom. 
Reverend Master Jiu in her <clears throat> autobiography, The Wild White Goose, talks about being whacked by the Kyosak in Japanese monastery where she trained Sojuji. And as a novice, she would, you know, receive the Kyosak just as the other trainees received the Kyosak. But then later, when she became a senior, she had her own temple. And there's a point where she says, every day the Kyosak comes. Every day the sword of Buddha's wisdom comes and points out some fault of mine. It wasn't that some other priest showed up and hit her with a stick. It was that life itself delivers the blows of the Kyosak delivers the blows of the sword of Buddha's wisdom. Of course, here in the West at Shasta Abbey and other temples of the order, we don't use the Kyosak to hit people. It is enough to point out that sometimes the Kyosak comes. Sometimes we must be able to receive correction for our behavior. <laughs> the service of Samantabhadra that we talked about last night, the work, the effort, these are all aspects of love. These are all aspects of selfless love. And I want to emphasize the selfless. A lot of our practice is just letting go of the self. There's a nice thing from the um, Bodhisattva of Kishtigarbha. We celebrate that festival. Kishtigarbha is said to help beings to, he confers the ability to, for beings to do good deeds in secret. And if you're one such as myself, who is all concerned about fame and gain and getting recognition and confirmation, that effort to do good deeds quietly in the background is quite welcome. The nice thing about the Bodhisattvas in Mahayana Buddhism is they all sort of overlap one another. So Samantabhadra is the one who patiently puts one foot in front of the other, bears that which needs to be born, does work, sometimes in the background, sometimes in the forefront, is in harmony with what is true and is universally worthy and good beyond our ideas of what is good and bad. Samantabhadra is the one who patiently continues, just working for the benefit of beings and working to perfect his 10 great vows. Homage to all the Buddhas in all worlds. Homage to all the Bodhisattvas in all worlds. Homage to the scripture of great wisdom. <laughs>